Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you might be in the world. We are here and we've got ourselves professional this evening. Um, mm -hmm. Effie um, from uh, Altex Academy is in a proper studio and everything, so putting us all to shame immediately. <laughs> um, welcome to you. Um, we'll un unpack your, your story and your journey in a minute. Good evening to Ian, who's recovered, and of course, His Royal Highness Sir Bruceness. Um, right, this week, this week, let's start. Let's start before we we'll, we'll, we'll keep you, uh, if you, if, if you, if you, am I saying that right? Ife. Oh, Ife, Ife, as long as, long as we can. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> DJI outrage. I've, I'm over it, really. I'm over all this fake outrage over remote ID um, caused by DJI stuff. What do we all think? Absolutely nothing. See that? No one, no one cares. Yeah. No one cares. No one cares. Anything. There's no outrage. It's oh, sorry, my computer started playing the live feed in the background, so I'm sitting here hearing it twice. But it's, it's not. It's not actually out outright. It's just. Uh, it's just a demonstration showing what it could be, but it's not actually available to a public. No, and, and that's coming. the thing with this. Yeah, you know, it's okay. DJI have released this uh, direct drone to phone, which is based off the broadcast ID standard, which the FAA are proposing, and that is in legislation in the EU already. So these two should not be mixed up. This is coming to the EU. There is no debate on this. Everything they're showing you is what the EU has mandated. Um, and within the FAA proposals, they are demonstrating the. Um, broadcast ID element and, and DJI in the video are really trying to push the broadcast ID as being enough. We don't want the network ID. Oh, oh no. Is it me or is it you? Oh, no, it's it's me. It sounds like it's Ian. He hasn't got over <laughs> that virus yet, eh? He hasn't got over that virus. No. Oh, and he's, he's, oh, back. And he's, yes. and he's back. And he's back. And he's back. Yeah, sorry, so I might have to go on to mobile Wi-Fi in a minute if it carries on. But yeah, and so the video caused quite a stir. Everyone's going, oh my God, DJI, if you do this, we're never going to buy your products again. The reality is DJI is showing you what the FAA are proposing. Nothing more, nothing less. The anger needs to be directed at the FAA here, not DJI. And I'm not going to sit here and tell anyone that they're not blameless in getting us to this point, but that doesn't matter. Here and now, what they are showing you is what our governments are requesting they do. So here's my challenge. Um, I mean, with us, we always like to dig a little deeper into operation side, into feasibility, right? So if this is was if the remote ID is getting broadcasted, I'm more interested in knowing this piece of legislation, how it works with other pieces of legislation, you know, privacy rules, other concerns, who, let's say if it gets into um, first responders, government works, that uh, works that already protected by some level of privacy or data concern, then how is this actually fitting in? That's, that's my interest. I mean, ultimately, if the industry wants to improve safety to know to share the data and know other drones out there, um, I, you know, ultimately that's the future at some point. Um, but before we get to that point, what's what's the practical way to manage it right now? That's what I'm not seeing. It is interesting because this. The easiest way to look at this is this is legislated around consumer off the shelf drones. Okay, so this is for products that will be bought for sale in the USA. So generally, general sale or model aviation at this moment in time, and in Europe, aircraft that want to comply with the new uh, open category system. So technically, for commercial drones, there is a get out in Europe that they would be in a different category, therefore they wouldn't have to comply. In the US, it isn't quite so clear because they are basically saying all UAS must have these features. But there was still space for a wriggle out in there for commercial use. But anyone who would be using a COTS, consumer off the shelf drone, for instance, in a in commercial environment would be subject to this taking place, this remote ID would be happening. And my biggest concern, it's always been the concern, is the privacy of the pilot. I have no idea, no issues with the aircraft transmitting its location. DJI are proposing it over the Wi-Fi away standard, over the S, uh, using the ASTM standard, which is about a couple of hundred meters in the sky. But the pilot location raises genuine security issues, not only theft, 
not only the possibility of him um, getting jumped, but also I, I do feel it could end the ability to run a single ops mission because currently as part of a, I'm a UK commercial operator and for me to be able to do something in the UK, I have to risk assess the chances of my takeoff location having someone enter it. Now, when I'm in a remote field somewhere that no one knows I'm there, those that risk factor is mitigated quite heavily simply because of the location. However, if that location is now being broadcast for everyone to see, that risk changes dramatically. And then you have to answer the question to yourself, are you able to control or mitigate that risk? And if you can't, it could mean that as a single operator, I wouldn't be able to fly. Now, my other question is what you're talking about is ground safety. And that's the same thing in Canada. We have to assess the location security and yes. we have to keep the distance uh, depending on the drone that you're using to any general public. So that's the ground safety. Now, my question is, would general aircraft, would men aircraft be able to access this remote ID data? And if if they can somehow, because partly it's also airspace safety, Right. I mean, at least at least here we're concerned with low flying aircraft, at least in Canada, if you're not in build up locations, um, men aircraft can fly lower than 500 feet if they yes. choose, if they deem this is safe to do so. And in the past, we've had when back when we have to issue NOTAM for certain flights within certain range of airports and aerodromes, we've seen that because NOTAMs are issued, it's actually calling for more manned aircraft if they choose, if they want to go circle around the area trying to see drones flying. So back to your concern, you know, this could be drawing more foot traffic, and I'm concerned if this would actually draw more air traffic as well. If so far, these regulations are, are not aimed at other airspace users being able to see where we are. It is simply about danger stranger is probably the right term to use that some person on the ground, including police, um, government, have the. Uh, you might have to change this. Might have to change this connection. Time to go mobile. Yeah, yeah time to go mobile. The end. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, 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 it is not about airspace safety. None of these remote ideas about airspace safety anywhere in the world. It's the most ridiculous concept in many, many ways. We've been following this for several years, and I think as a group, we personally prefer the French flashing lights method. That was the Morse code signaling the lights on the thing. That was the, the most exciting. I don't know which one you prefer, Bruce, but it's it's kind of a nonsense and it's been driven by uh utm uh, providers who have got a hat in the ring because they've bought radio companies to make remote id devices if if they don't go that's why kind of why dji is pushing this standard because it's easier to do and it's yeah. easier to retrofit on lots of brands lots of other brands not just dji anyone using the wi-fi standard we have to do it but if they don't go because of course they might not go for this uh, Wi-Fi standard, they might go for another standard of a different radio device that would then have to be fitted on everything as well. Uh, would still be you'd still be able to see uh, the same details, but it, it wouldn't be a Wi-Fi broadcast. So there's still still scope for plenty of shenanigans that we should be annoyed about. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting that the three things they're claiming are safety, security, and accountability. Those are the three goals of all this remote idea. Safety, obviously, we know that's a farce, it's a joke, because show me the bodies. Security, well, I haven't seen any instances where drones have actually compromised security any more than satellites whirring overhead, people with cameras, with long lenses. There's, there's no security issues at all. And accountability, well, Look from accountability point of view, bad people will always do bad things no matter what you try and do. And just as we mentioned many times before, people are going to rob a bank, don't drive the family car down to do it, they steal a car. So if you're going to do something that you don't want to be held accountable for with a, dr accountable for with a drone, you steal a drone, use someone else's drone, then they get in trouble. None of these issues are going to be adequately addressed by the huge burden that remote ID places on people. And I think it annoys me most of all is people saying, this is a certainty, this is already done, this is guaranteed, remote ID is here. No, it's not. It's not here yet. No, it's only going to be a certainty if people say, oh, OK, I'll do it. If they say, no, we're not doing it, then it's not a certainty at all. And this whole thing about um, with the hobby, they're going to make it 
effectively illegal, you know, going to be prohibited. Well, prohibition worked so well for the US government in the 1920s, didn't it? Why didn't it work? Lack of compliance. <laughs> the, the, the power is in the hands of the people. If you just say, no, we don't like that rule, we're not going to comply with that rule, the rule becomes totally ineffective. And sure, a few people might get their, their hands smacked and some people may even go to jail. But a freedom that is worth having is worth fighting for. And I'm saying to people, don't fall for this line that, oh, it's 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 going to happen. It's going to ha No, it's not going to happen because it doesn't address any of the three objectives that the government is proposing as being the rationale, the raison d'etre for this remote ID. It doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. As for privacy, um, you know, you're saying, oh, you know, um, government doesn't respect privacy. Well, here in New Zealand, we just had a report. Someone was flying a drone in a national park where flying drones is illegal. And someone else threw a stone and knocked it out of the sky. And the, the people from the national park said, oh, this incident, you know, uh, shows that dro they, drones, disturb other people's privacy and quiet enjoyment of the outdoors. So obviously privacy is a big issue. Yet, as, as um, Ian's pointed out, they want to throw your privacy to the winds and say, well, anytime you're flying, anyone can find out where you are and go and mug you or whatever. The interesting thing with the New Zealand report also is that they're saying, oh, you know, we can't let drones fly national parks because it, it disturbs other people's quiet enjoyment of the outdoors. And another reason is there are helicopter operations taking place almost every day and drone use puts these aircraft and their pilots at risk. Well, um, excuse me, but if you've got helicopters operating, uh, they make a lot more noise than drones. They disturb people's private quiet enjoyment of a park more than a drone would. There is so much let me use the word bovine excrement involved in this whole damn thing that it's time someone stood up and said the emperor's got no clothes you people are making ridiculous assertions you cannot back up with science and evidence so we are not going to follow your stupid rules until such times you come back with some facts and evidence some logical thought and you don't just sit in the pockets of these lobbyists who've got millions of dollars to throw around call me a radical but that's my perspective currently a free radical but should anything you know should you really protest you probably won't be i reserve um, the right to charge at a later date <laughs> there you go <laughs> yeah it's a thorny subject and i'm disappointed with the the the, the number of responses yeah um especially as well i respect you've all three or i have all i don't know if um uh, if, uh, if 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 you've commented but certainly three out of four of us have commented and we don't live in america Yep. Um, <laughs> and then that's the thing. If you look at the numbers, we're down to nine hundred and ninety, whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, we, we're we're in the neighboring body of uh, of US, um, and uh, it seems that uh, Canada is always trying to align with uh, where US regulation falls. So definitely, it will take an effect in Canada. Um, but like I said, I'm always interested in the actual implementation. I mean, the government or or any entity can always come up with a concept. Right. There can always be the concept, but it always comes down to what's the actual implementation. You know, Bruce said it that about compliance from operators. Uh, I'm also interested in actual enforcement from the government, because as we've seen with the Canadian regulations since last year, if enforcement doesn't come in, you know, when people don't comply and they don't get punished for it, then basically there is it's, it defeats the purpose of that piece of regulation or rule. Well, yeah, yeah. Roland's saying in the comments in Europe they want the same. That it's it's yeah. already in law in Europe, no, Roland. It's not yeah. they want the same. It's in law. In law. <laughs> it's coming. No. Yeah. Uh, but on the flip side, we should say the European regulation is fairly lax in the sense of, yeah. if you to have a product that doesn't comply, you can basically do everything you do today. There's no forced. You can fly a non-compliant product exactly the same as you can today. You get benefits from actually comply with the new system that's the basics they're going to allow you to fly closer in congested areas than you've ever been able to do before so the european approach is actually quite clever what they're saying is if you do what you're doing today you can do exactly the same as you're doing today and no change whether it be model aircraft or drone however after today if you want to have new benefits you can then get a compliant aircraft with remote ID, and then you'll be able to do this. Now, whether there will be a restriction on sale of non-compliant aircraft, I don't know, because the FAA have been very clear they will, whereas I think Europe is slightly different. Um, it, 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 it is, it's not ideal, 
but it's certainly nowhere near as bad as the US. I'll touch a bit on Bruce because Bruce gave me some crap in the week, quite deservedly so as well, because I was approaching it from a certain point, which I didn't explain. Uh, And my point is, I think it's done and dusted from a consumer off the shelf drone point of view, Bruce, which I mean like a phantom. You know, you know, I, 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 from that point of view, and it is done and dusted in Europe. So I'm coming from it from a slightly different angle as well. From a model aviation point of view, this needs to change. It should not be involved, period, and people need to feed back. What is concerning, though, 24,000 signatures. If you take all the DJI Facebook groups, there's over 160,000 members, RC groups. Bruce has over 200 subs between your two groups, Bruce. About 300 and something. Some so I don't know. Yeah. But, but at the end of the day, there's still a large part of that US based as well. Um, we're just the even as much as the message we're shouting. Bruce has shouted it more than anyone. We're not getting the people saying this. We're just not getting the numbers. Well, again, I'm gonna. I'm, I don't really want to diss the flight test guys too much. They've been to town. They've had a chat. They're, 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 let me, let me they're doing them. it all on their own 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 little side channel that nobody yeah. watches. Also, I could not believe it. They are so politically naive. Um, they came back from a meeting with the FAA saying, yeah. we weren't aware that the FAA didn't understand the hobby. Did the FAA understand the hobby? They, they, they've fed them a line. They've, as I've said so many times, they've told them what they wanted to hear. Oh, you're going yeah. to, you're going to, you know, yeah. no, grow up, you people. You, you've obviously never dealt with politicians and bureaucrats before. The FAA is basically just holding you at arm's length, holding you at arm's length. And then like they did with the AMA with Section 336, ha ha, we won, goodbye. It's, it's no, you've really really got to be quite aggressive when you're dealing with these people. They, they will fob you off forever a month of Sundays. So flight test, as you say, they're patting at it. They want to be seen to be um, working for the hobby, but they're working for Flight Test Incorporated, yeah. LLC. That's what they're working for. And so they, they, they've got a dollar each way because originally they were all in yeah. favour of this electronic ID. Let's, let's be on it. Th- yeah. Sorry, Bruce. No, no, no. Go, go Ian. I was just going to say, let's be honest, the, all the AMA flight test will all benefit from this coming in because it forces people to their sites and that's that's isn't it as you mentioned there yeah yeah I mean, it's yeah they're, 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 there's definitely a benefit i just i'm just yeah and and remember our old shouty patrick was at the at the flight meeting that scared the bedillies out of both the faa and uh, the U.S. military, when they demonstrated uh, jets and uh, large, large, large RC model aircraft in 2008, uh, seven or eight, it was. Uh, Patrick was there with his slow stick, and that's when, uh, if you have been around long enough, you remember there was going to be speed restrictions. I'm surprised that didn't. There come. are speed restrictions. You had to have a waiver oh, to go over 200 miles an hour in the USA with a model. Oh, it was going to be. Yeah. It was going to be much, much lower than that. It was going to yeah. be 80 knots. But you know why that happened, don't you? Because you had all the military contractors with their, you know, hundred thousand dollar jet powered drones saying, "Oh, this technology is state of the art. It can't be replicated. You have to pay a premium yeah. for this." We're exactly and then they saw these hobbyists <laughs> doing it three times better. That's exactly <laughs> what it was. Exactly that video of Bruce's was. was scary. That video where you sat there with the FAA. The, they're all scary, but the the, the yeah. one with the FAA basically have said they want to repeal that law and they want to regulate it to death. You know that they were blunt in that video. There was no hiding. There was no. It was complete intent shown, and the guy who was trying to stand up got shot down and silenced. And it, you know, there's no other way to look at that other than it was. I, I'm really surprised at how how tight the regulations seem, you know, seem seem like through the discussion. Because on the Canadian side, I, I remember all the Canadian operators were saying, "Oh, look at US, look at the you know regulations really opened up." Because when we had the 100 feet rule to general public, um, US didn't have that. So a lot of the operators were saying, well, look at look at the, the states, you know, you don't have that much regulations and you can basically go open up a lot on innovation on trying to do different things. But from the sound of it, it sounds like it's it's just grass is greener on the other side. Oh, yeah, it's fu- fundamentally changed. If this comes in, it fundamentally changes. They've gone from a position of having some of the least regulation to the worst in the world overnight. Well, it's not overnight, though, is it? It's been coming for 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a trend. 
It's a trend. Yep. Look at Australia. They had some of the best drone regulations they in the did. world. And if their they new did. regulations come in, they'll be some of the worst as well. It's like everyone's playing follow the leader, which is why the whole world should be very, very concerned about America's situation situation because they lead. Where they go, everyone follows, perhaps except a few people in Brussels. But most of the other world follows America's lead. So when they will, whatever America does, they will join in and do it twice as bad. They're all trying to be the worst possible regulator in the world, and they're all succeeding. They all have their time at the top. But instead of them being logical and sensible and saying, well, look, everyone's got some good ideas, but also everyone's got some really bad ones. Let's just cherry pick the best ones and create a set of regulations which are a good balance, a good measure of control or get compliance because they provide the right amount of freedom versus responsibility. And if, you, if they did that, they put New Zealand's shielded operation and other bits from other countries, they uh, Canada's no prescriptive regulation for sub-250 craft. They brought them all together in a package and then made it unified across the world. Everybody would be happy. But no, you've always got someone trying to make a name for themselves by trying to do it better than the rest of the world, even when they know they're not. Yeah, it's uh, it's weak to talk about this. <laughs> but yeah, it is. But but really, you know, on the thing of it, it, it you know, all of the anger was thrown at DJI. It's the wrong yeah. place. You know, this it is was. not DJI. In in fact, I think they were being very clever putting this video out right now. They were making people aware. At the end of the day, is the world's largest drone manufacturer of how this will affect them and i think it was a very clever move doing it right now you know they could have done it after the fact they didn't have to do it right now um it, there's no such thing as bad publicity as they say however i think it, it's a good thing they did it at the end of the day yeah they it's could have done a better job of learning. explaining though they yes. could have done a better job of explaining why why um their system was different and better because they sort of put them side by side and say look you know our system's good here's what they they want they they should have made the point that um you know, this is really bad, and, and so ours is a better option. I, when I looked at the video, I thought, mm, they're just pitching theirs as a, as a watered-down version of that, um, and not so much vilifying that as saying ours is better. They should have said, well, this is totally unacceptable for the following yep. reasons. Uh, rather you than know, they're, clearly, they're clearly against Network ID, aren't they, Bruce? You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, too, too, too many people are going to hold the, the keys to the kingdom. To that first... Um, 400 feet of airspace know your enemy that's why i put that in the in the thumbnail uh, this time i mean it is amazon and co that of course caused this to happen and uh, here's my little prediction is that will all fail uh, all that uh, all that delivery drones in cities will fail that won't work in the delivery drones yeah. in the countryside that might work medical supplies out and about that might work in the city it's coming in a van on a rainy windy day it's not coming on the drone and if they want to make these regulations really simple for recreational users, then keep all the commercial operators above 200 feet, except for zones where they have landing areas, because they're going to be landing in your backyard. They're going to be going point to point, you know, as you say, it's going to be business to business rather than business to consumer. So they can have prescribed flight paths where you can't fly a anything other than a commercial drone with the right authorities. You can have uh, exclusion areas of maybe 200 meters around a landing point, so you can't fly in those areas. But everywhere else, zero to 200 feet or whatever, it's, it, you know, no, there's no manned aircraft there. There shouldn't be any commercial drones there. So what is the problem? Yeah, and uh, Ife was mentioning, or Ife, sorry, uh, was mentioning uh, low-flying aircraft. There's a simple fix for that. Um, they've just got to get up out of unmanned space, up out of use space. No, now I say no GA below two K. Get them up and get them out of the way. Um, exactly. It's hard to them. We outnumber them. Except they don't follow that rule. Just well, we know that aviators don't follow I, I, the rules. I agree. That's except the they don't follow the rules, especially let's say you know sprayers for farms. They just go fly wherever they feel like. I, again, in they, Canada, yeah. if you have uh, just a grass landing strip, you can be an aerodrome. Right, you can have yeah, yeah. Um, a garage yeah. where you house an aircraft, and you don't get regulated by land or or city bylaws. You get regulated by federal airspace, and still a lot of people with smaller airplanes, and that's what they do, and they just go fly where they want to. And this is what yeah. annoys me. We're we're expected to be responsible for the bad actions of other people, you know, because the, the manned aircraft, unmanned aircraft, must always give way to manned aircraft. And it's like when we had the jet meeting a couple of weekends ago. Runway was closed, no tanned, white crosses out, and we still had manned aircraft deciding they were going to come and land. I'm sorry, but if you hit my model because you choose to break the rules on several levels, why am I going to be held responsible? No, you take responsibility for your own bad actions. Don't say it's all the problem, it's all caused by drones. No, it's caused by manned aviators not following their own damn rules. So 
you can't just make us all accountable because we fly toys and they fly expensive aeroplanes. <laughs> well, you can uh, apparently it's perfectly okay to kill yourself on a steam powered rocket. It's a horror. It's, I shouldn't have put it like that. It. <laughs> He, it was coming his way, wasn't it? But it's still horrible. I feel sorry for his family. But the FAA said, well, nothing to do with this, mate. How can that be? How can that be that a Mavic has more regulation than someone firing himself into the air in a steam-powered rocket? That's why I, I say we've got to tell the FAA, until you've got some at least some common sense behind these, if not science and logic and reason and, and so forth, until you've got something that's, that doesn't make it a, a farce of the whole thing, take them away. We're not interested in any of this regulation. We're not going to comply with any of it at all until it makes sense. Because if we comply with nonsensical regulation, then we'll be held accountable when it doesn't work and people die. Oh, well, you know, you should have, you should have told us it wasn't going to work. Well, we're telling you now. We're not going to comply. Go away. Come back with something sensible. Yeah, well, I, I think I think fifty years time from now, uh, standard aviation regulators won't have anything to do with uh, unmanned space. I don't. I don't think they'll be. I think think we are the thin end of the wedge for the manned community. They don't realise it's coming, but they will be shoved up. They will. If 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 Amazon and Co get their way, they want the first two thousand feet of airspace, and they want all airspace above flight level six six zero. They want those two chunks that nobody's ever wanted before. Uh, too hard to have the bits where the airliners fly. Uh, but, oh, yeah, we'll have those bits, please. And and that's, yeah. That's I agree, because, I mean, this is something we've been, we've been fighting on um, with uh, the navigational charts in Canada, is if you look at the Class C airspace, which I believe in states is Class B, is around your large international airports. You look at the you know five to ten nautical miles radius that starts from the surface level. Where where are men aircraft going to fly at the surface level five nautical miles from a large international airport? Why are they occupying that level of airspace when they I never actually that. use it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They only they only need they only need airspace to go where the runways go they're not yeah. not either the side yeah, of the they, uh, they really need to reclassify the airspace um where Edmund is well at least reclassify to where they actually use i understand before they didn't have the need to but now there is the need and they should better reclassify it absolutely and that's i don't, don't again another prediction I, oh, I heard a great thing today i've got to got to change my linkedin title what was it it was a great thing an absolute nonsense uh thing to call yourself i've got to try and remember what it is like a uh, a future forecast i say future forecaster i'm gonna be a future forecaster now i could do What's that your crystal ball yeah well no you see that wasn't mentioned but yeah exactly future, future but forecasting forecast. implies future that's a bit redundant doesn't it no, but I love it. I love that term. I'm, I'm going to be one of those now on LinkedIn. A temporal extensionist. Be. Yes. Oh, what's that say again? A temporal extensionist. A temporal extensionist. Oh, hang on. Let me write that down. Anyway, uh, where was I going with that? I don't know. I don't know now. <laughs> That's I remembered that. But it, yeah, um, the, the next prediction is that, that yeah, or well, the prediction <laughs> yeah, is that, uh, that the. Um, that, that we won't be in the world of civil aviation authorities, that we'll be removed. Hey, oh, how do you do that? Damn, <laughs> <laughs> FAA's got him. Hey, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you go. hear a black helicopter moments before that happened? I that's a nice trick. Let's talk about crystal balls and all that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why Ian that, walks funny, isn't it? That's why he walks funny. It's because it's because he's got crystal balls. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. All right, let's let's um uh, move on to Eve. Um, futurologist, exactly all that nonsense. I was hopefully Ian's gone off to get uh, the the link of that video for Peter. I see he wants the link for the DJI video. I'm going to put a link in the comments now because um I saw a fantastic video, one that should have gone absolutely viral in our world of commercial drones and dronerists and all those other things. And that's Ife's video from Altex Academy. And it was about parachute tests. Hang on, let's wind back a second. I meant to lead in with this first with, in Taiwan, I don't know if you've seen it, dear viewer, but there was at the Lantern Festival, an 800 drone formation over the weekend that suffered a loss of 48 of them uh, uh, in flight due, it's believed, to jamming, uh, which is quite impressive, isn't it? And in that situation, you'd need to think, and he's back. 
you 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 missed how you went away there. You just disappeared. I don't know how. But <laughs> Sorry. It was very good. No, it was very good. It was very very good. Um, but no, the, so eight hundred eight hundred drones in formation. Forty eight of them fell out of the sky due to jamming. Now, if they had parachutes, that would have made the whole thing a lot safer. And I'm sure, um, if you've been looking at parachutes for your commercial operations over there in Canada. We've, uh, we started looking at parachutes when we were back flying our heavy lift. So my background came from filming. We used to build a heavy lift and uh, and fly basically five kilograms of, uh, of camera payload. Um, and as we talked about in the video back then, you know, the concern wasn't about the drone or protecting the camera. The concern was when you're on a star shoot with famous directors and, and actors, you don't want the drone to fall on somebody else's head. <laughs> So that was really the main concern. And uh, especially, you know, back then when you build heavy lift, it's, it's just a home assembly. It's not a manufactured product that's gone through R&D, right? It was all the fun times of uh, you build something, put it up into the air and cross your fingers. It doesn't fall down from the sky, right? So, so back then, that was what we started looking at parachutes a long time ago. And the first concern was you don't know where it's actually falling. And where you potentially use parachute is, it's interesting, this is something we didn't actually discuss in the video, was the, the locations where you typically use the parachute would be fairly crowded, right? City locations or at, you know, events. So depending on wind, if you can't predict where it's falling, then what you end up doing is just buying yourself the time. So it's supposed to really slow down the fall of the drone and at least you can evacuate um, where it's falling to to make sure it doesn't crash on somebody else's head. So really, ultimately, it's buying that additional time. That's really what parachute ends up doing for a drone. And back then, technology wasn't ready. But uh, last year, uh, as we've seen, there are actually quite a few parachute companies came out and they all got uh, some level of compliance, at least uh, at least in Canada to basically be able to fly over people. And with events, that's always, you know, one thing that's stopping people is not being able to, to legally fly at events. And companies like Terra Zero, uh, Indemnus, and I believe there's um, another one, ABSS, they all got the government compliance, which is that safety um, assurance declaration in Canada. So if you have one of those UAV, UAS, you know, RPAS, whichever terminology you call them, then you can fly actually legally over people at public events. So that's really been the main demand. And then you went to demonstration. I've put a link. I'm going to put it in again, give you a couple of people to come later. Um, you went to uh, an event. Uh, I was. Well, I can't remember the company now. Was it? Was it Paris? It, uh, uh, it was Paris Zero. Zero. So, so yeah. So what we did is we invited Paris Zero to our flight field. So it's actually uh, demonstrated on our flight field, just thirty minutes north of Toronto. Uh, so what happened is, <laughs> because of the pricing of this parachute, for example, the one for Mavic Two is actually more expensive than the actual Mavic Two. So logically, we were thinking before someone wants to buy this, you know, you definitely want to see this thing in action, we want to see this thing work for one. And then two is uh, to determine, you know, seeing is believing, right? Too many things we buy off the internet and then dealing with uh, the aftermath, right? <laughs> so we invited two manufacturers to come in and the uh, indemnity didn't make it over the summer. So it was basically just pair zero. And um, I just want to clarify, because a lot of people actually didn't know, it was conducted by the actual Parazero representative. So the actual demonstration wasn't conducted by us. It was conducted by the representative. And uh, the idea was given if the parachute test was successful, then we were going to conduct more actual operator tests based on, for example, performance on the Mavic 2. Does it actually decrease Mavic 2's flight time and how much? Does it actually affect the flight performance? And some people were saying uh, about the GPS that it blocks GPS signal that causes GPS signal issues. So there are more operational things that we, want, we really wanted to put to test. Uh, unfortunately, all three parachute tests failed. So we didn't see, we didn't see the need of us proceeding to you know, more scientific testing. <laughs> yes. And what surprised me, really surprised me, was that there was a separate controller for, to fire the parachute. Um, so you had your your normal. Did you? Did, so you never you never got to fire the parachute. It was all their operator. Correct. Yeah, it was all um, Parazero representatives. 
So how did they handle having two transmitters, both the DJI controller well, and the Tarantula? Luckily, was. they were on our field, which is a designated drone flight field. So we had uh, we had you know location support, we had tables, we had gazebos, chairs. We made it comfortable, right? Because when you train people, you want people to be comfortable when they're actually you know flying and learning the skills. So in a practical situation, most of the time when you go out to a, a, a field, when you go out to a, a job site. To fly, you don't get all the luxury location support. So just like you mentioned, and that was one of the issues we we brought. So apparently, what Parazero had said, they said they released a separate controller. Um, I haven't seen it, but they said they released a separate controller that's much smaller and easier for deployment. And and this is one of the things we said at the end of the video. You know, this is first gen of this technology from them. I'm sure there are improvements so the questions we raised in the video was basically for the purpose of you know hoping manufacturer is going to take in those considerations and go make the improvements that's really the goal ultimately i think any effort to help to improve the safety it's always good effort uh, which is why you know we're here as third party independent tester to actually test those efforts see if they actually make sense because what people think of in you know back in the manufacturer and then do engineer tests is very different than when it actually gets into the hands of operators and people actually use it in practical situations, right? It's quite interesting. On the day, the next day, the next day after I saw your video, I saw a police department in the states on LinkedIn saying, "Look, we've just been given our permission to operate over people because of we fit this exact same thing they fitted." And so I said, "Are you sure?" And I posted a link to your video, <laughs> and then then the chap messages me and says um, well we've never actually fired once we're gonna have to try that so i think just thinking how do you get permission to operate over people with a device that you've never tested how can that work just so this this is something I, we've raised as well uh, you know, we can all make a box i can make a box and say it's a parachute on it and then open it up and a load of sweets come out as the things falls to the ground or whatever or flowers that'd be nice mm -hmm. wouldn't it Shouldn't you know, this be certified? Shouldn't that be certified by the regulator? So you know, they with a stamp that says this works, kachunk, because most aviation's like that, isn't um, it? You can't... So it's it's through that ASTM standards. So if they've gone through the <laughs> well, again, that's a different that's a different can of worm. Um, but yeah. that's that's the channel, right? You go through the ASTM yeah, yeah. standards, which you do what 45 or 35, 45 testings, I believe, successful deployment. Um so basically, with, with the third failed deployment on our side, ParaZero's response was they didn't train their representative properly, and the parachute was strapped too tight. That was the reason for uh, the actual hardware didn't deploy to stop the motors. And if it doesn't stop the motors, as we saw from the video, that's when the parachute shot up and got tangled in the steel propelling, you know, uh, motors, and that was the issue. So really, for us, from testing, again, just strictly from testing perspective, is what happens when you have engineers doing tests, when you have people who design the uh, equipment to do tests, is they do it in a specific set way, right? That's very different than once you start releasing your product into the hands of general public. How general public interprets your instruction manual, interprets your training manual, that's all very different. So going back to the ASTM standards, you know, I really believe this should be some kind of more testing involving people at arm's length rather than just people who actually understand the system inside out. There's, there's a few issues. There's one guys. rule I didn't tell you about. Sorry, I'll just, I just need to tell, um, I just need to tell you the rules. We don't allow common sense on our channel, and you've just spoken <laughs> common sense. Common sense is not allowed in this industry. I'm sorry, it just it's just not allowed. But anyway, there's, you know the rules now. There's, there's a few issues here, though. Number one, a standard is not a certification. So a standard is building it to a standard. That is not the same as something being certified as works. So it, it's interesting that they're saying, yeah, it's made to an ASTM standard. Okay, that's that's mostly the behavior of the electronics and with the way it triggers in certain levels of G and things like that and how it falls. That doesn't mean it's going to actually behave that way. Having watched the video, I felt they, these things weren't even in beta stage. I'd say they were alpha stage technology, not even beta. You know, you would expect beta to be virtually fully functioning. However, um, maybe not 
um, consumer ready. This was alpha. You know, they fundamentally failed in a number of tests. How anyone is allowing anyone to use these to get certification to fly over people is, is bonkers. You know, the, clearly, I, I've seen the units in hand, actually. I got to see them at the drone show in the UK this year. And I did raise some concerns when I saw the way it rotates to block the propellers mm -hmm. on the Mavic especially the way it hovers over the top on the phantom of the gps as you say it comes right over the top of the gps or so the phantom is slightly different on the mavic sorry it's slightly different depending on the aircraft you fundamentally look at this as an engineer and go this is a bad idea in many many different ways um it the problem pr zone have to be careful of is if one of these fails and someone gets hurt their business ends overnight. So, it, yeah, the liability here is, yeah. is huge, you know, huge, huge, huge. But, yeah, th there's no certification here, is there? There's a standard. They can say that the relays will trigger in the event of a motor loss in 0. 0.x seconds. It will fire the parachute in 0. 0.x seconds if, as long as it's above the ground. All of this is theoretical. The reality is if it doesn't actually work in real-world tests, then it's pointless. Yeah, and uh, there's the percentage of real world test, right? What's the yeah. margin of error that's actually acceptable? Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and going back, going back to to Gary's note on uh, um, testing this ahead of time. I mean, that was my comment in the video: is everyone runs emergency drills. It's never about it's never about how right the procedures are or how right the equipment is. In the emergency situation, is all about how people actually react to it because people freak mm. out. If yeah. you don't, if you don't yeah. practice that emergency drill several yeah. times, people are gonna freak out. They're gonna forget what they are supposed to do. Yeah, and it's yeah. anything exactly. You know, you don't pick up. You know, you don't have a fire in your house and have to have ten fire extinguishers, hoping one of them actually works. You know, because that's the scenario we have here. If you look at this, you know, the chances of a drone crashing are actually infinitesimally small the chances of having a failure on a good qualified operator who knows how to charge his batteries who knows how to fly it's going to be probably once in a 10,000 plus hour situation and that safety device has to work it's no ifs no buts it has to be a hundred percent reliable that it will do its job now that's not to say it will stop a crash but it must fire it must cause the aircraft to stop working and then float it to the ground and if it can't do that a hundred percent of the time then it's not fit for purpose so this thing's called the chocolate teapot is it yeah yeah, well, or fire guard. Um, Victor um, <laughs> has, has very kindly checked out, realised and checked out the very important th uh, thing that the uh, former director of the FAA, Michael Herter, is on the advisory board to ParaZero. So, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we have our answer. Why is that flying in police forces and approved? That's why. FAA, God love them. Oh, so, be careful. <laughs> I'll be taken away like Ian was. Um, but they, they're not, they don't shine themselves in glory, do they? I, and I don't understand how, I really don't understand how you cannot have had any training or fired one life and be flying over crowds with it as a police force. Just because you're a policeman doesn't mean you're instantly able to use this thing. Um, I, you know, I would have thought you, you would have had to have had mandatory training and two or three firings or something. Because uh, you had a 100% failure rate, didn't you, in your tests? <laughs> yeah, Correct. Yeah. And 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 going back to so so the first one that first deployment with a non ASTM kit has been taken off market, and I think for a good reason because we did a little bit of research and we checked the uh, the comments on BNH because BNH sells the non ASTM kit, and if you look at all the bad reviews on BNH, it's all because they didn't deploy and actually crashed some of these drones. Can you imagine having an airbag in a car that only went off one of ten times? Yeah, well, it's, it's many, 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 many examples. But you, you know, you, how can you get away with selling a thing? Well, yeah, well, we have to be careful what we sell, I suppose. Uh, it must have worked once somewhere. <laughs> at, the end of, at the end of the day, this is being sold as a kit. So I should be able to buy it. And, uh, I'm an idiot. Okay, I should be able to buy it. I should be able to bolt it onto one of my aircraft. And I should be able to detonate this thing and test it. And they don't have to, you know, replace it for me if I choose to do that. But I, I should be able to 99% know if I follow the instructions, 
that it will do the job it's intended to do. And that's the very basics of a consumer product, let yeah. alone a safety product. Yeah, so <laughs> let go, alone... going back to going back to Gary's note on um, basically we're talking operations, right? It's one thing to say there's a piece of equipment or a piece of regulation. It's very different when you look at operations. And that's that's something, at least on the Canadian side, when new Rex came out, it's something everyone's been talking about because uh, all the all the pressure and all the stress is put on pilot certification, which says as a pilot, you have to have operational procedures, checklist and all that. But we haven't seen, you know, actual proven track record of all of, the, all of that being enforced or being compliant. And that's the same thing with uh, with parachute or any type of equipment. You almost have to have, have um you know, almost instructional for dummies, so to speak, <laughs> instruction manual for dummies. It has to be, it has to be able to work with your your regular, you know, standard people. Someone who's not a engineer genius or someone who's never built, uh, never built a drone before. And that's where independent fine. certification comes in, isn't it? Because you have a third party that's unrelated to the design, development, and implementation of the product, reviewing it as if they were an actual user. And the thing that concerns me a bit about these safety products, especially the unproven ones, is that if you're operating a drone and you've got the choice of planning your flight so as to avoid the risk of flying over people, or saying, oh, I don't care, I've got a parachute and flying over people, yeah. which is the best way to approach that. Um, me, call me conservative, even though I'm, I'm a maniac. I always avoid flying over people, even though I know the odds are very small because, you know, sometimes bad things happen. And I would never fly over people unless it was the absolute last option, even if I had a parachute, because as we've seen, parachutes don't always work. So is this going to actually reduce safety rather than improve it? Yeah, I'd actually agree with you there, Bruce. I well, think it will, it will cause people to have a false sense of security, won't it? And th the other thing with this is is the interesting part of what, look what's happened every time we've allowed someone to self-regulate. Let's look at Boeing. Let's look at VW when they were all allowed to self-regulate and certify their equipment. Look where we ended up. Because hmm. I, I, I wouldn't say, again, <laughs> um, Patrick and I were on the first telephone call when ASTM started talking about what they'd like to do for the drone industry and we lasted a few meetings until we realized that it was going to be and each standard is like 75 dollars to buy and all this sort of thing and made by you can't i don't want i don't i don't want to be and we didn't we didn't want to be part of a standards group that's gonna pay, you have to pay to look at the standard that's like that's not on that's not very open fair and uh open to scrutiny and interrogation well, well, look at the ASTM standard for remote ID, eighty-five pounds if you want to see that yeah. in the UK. Well, that's no, that's that's yeah, that's but each one, the battery standard, yep. the parish standard, that you have to one, pay for everyone. Yep, yeah, each, yep, each each one. So that's not a group, in my humble opinion, that is set up in order to because um, they're supposed to safety. charge. They're supposed to charge whoever wants to meet the standards instead of whoever wants to actually see the standards. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. How do you know the standard meets your needs if you can't read it in the first place? Well, have you have you tried to search what ASTM stands for on their web page? Because I couldn't find. I mean, I think as any any professional organization, the first thing you need to do on your web page is to spell out what it stands for. Um, and I couldn't. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I could try to make something, up. something now as well, which I can say. Uh, <laughs> Maybe it doesn't stand for anything. Maybe it's a new noun that they've invented. Maybe, yeah. but it's uh, so. Yeah, we we again we were on. That's how old we are. We were on those first calls, and we decided that SES News couldn't couldn't be involved. We were asked to be involved with the STM, and we decided we couldn't because we didn't like the way the. The standards rolled out because neither of us knew anything about standards before we were asked because we didn't. Um, Any it, yeah. standard, tons of money. Yeah, 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 yeah. Any, anything will do. And well, the original, all the original bins that were happening in America for aircraft size were being driven by air environment, and they all exactly fitted uh, all the air environment products. Funnily enough, spookily, <laughs> they're all within their weight bands as they went up and down, and um, that that wasn't very fair. Uh, I can't remember what happened to to get that changed. I think a few other things came along, or Europe got ahead, or Australia got ahead, or something. But we we uh, this has been a long time coming, all this fuss and nonsense. And uh, unfortunately, I think it's all 
all coming to a head that people people with money that want to make lots of money or think they're going to make lots of money out of it all um, are, are getting their way already. I, That's a bit of a yeah, for me. I was I was disappointed to see the the results of the parachute tests because you guys did a great job on demonstrating mm. it in real world use, and it was mm. a shame to see. You know, it's the kind of thing I'd like to have played with myself, but and it's a shame just to see. Right, you pitched up to a place, you strapped it on, and then suddenly everything became hassle. And it was just like, wow. Okay, I understand the second remote controller. I know why they do that. It's not a tidy solution, but it's a solution. Um, I've seen other manufacturers do it. They have their own dedicated little remote controller, actually, some mm -hmm. of the others. They're not using a standard RC remote, using a, an included separate one. Um, and it, it, it just become all very evasive, the, the way it felt. You know, like they didn't want this to happen. And um, one of the things that Bruce mentioned was making pilots overconfident. And if you look at the, a lot of the accidents, especially at crowded spaces, the, the accidents don't happen because the equipment fail. The accidents happen because the pilots were over, overconfident and because of the visual, you know, when you look at a drone from a ground perspective, your entire visual feels different, right? And pilots felt overconfident, they ended up flying into a tree flying into a building, flying through wires. That's when majority of the accidents happen with actual drones in the air. And in those scenarios, parachute actually won't help with the situation. I think we need a lower tech solution. Now, imagine how many hard hats you can buy for the price of one of these parachutes. Just give everyone a hard hat. I mean, this solves the problem. Branded, branded hard hats as well, advertising as well. Perhaps with snacks. Hats, hard yeah. hats, and snacks. That's, that's probably the way to go. You know, what, yeah. one of the questions we wanted to ask Parazero or any other uh, parachute manufacturer was, when you guys got founded, um, what's your business plan? Because everyone does a market analysis on what's the potential market size. That's something I was really interested in for, you know, specifically for this pricing of that parachute unit. I wanted to know what market analysis they've actually done. How many pilots can actually make their money back, their return on investment, you know, purchasing a parachute at this price? Yes, because what are we they charging know. for the certified kit again? How much is that? 2,500 Canadian. So about 2,000 wow. US for wow. Mavic 2 Pro. Yeah, more expensive. Plus than the cost of getting certified as well on top of that, isn't it? Getting um no, so it, it comes I again I don't know how it works in US, but in Canada, um Para Zero compliant their system. So Para Zero declared their system at safety assurance to transport. So when you buy a when you buy a Mavic 2 and put a Para Zero on, at that point Para Zero becomes the manufacturer. So your equipment, yeah. the drone you buy. Uh, meets this meets the government requirement to fly over people. Does it change its registration or how the government yeah. views it? So you need to have two registrations on it. If uh, if you if some of your flights has parachute on and some of your flights don't, you need to have two registration numbers on it. And the other interesting point I actually didn't know was someone brought it up that if you buy a DJI Phantom Four. The traditional DJI instruction for the specs, it says operating from zero to 40 Celsius, so no minus temperature. But if you buy it with Para Zero and use Para Zero's instruction manual, somehow it changes the operating range from minus 10 to plus 40. And no one, no one was able to explain how did they get that. <laughs> it keeps the dry and warm in the winter. <laughs> Yes, yeah, like a little coat, a little jacket. Yes, that is. But, and, and, and yet, the actual battery inside Para Zero is a teeny little RC LiPo battery that we used to buy to put on, you know, a, a second remote control or something, and it didn't last very long. And you can't change it, it's not interchangeable. So yeah. if, if 40 minutes it runs out, um, you have to put it on charge for over an hour before you can use it. Yeah, is that 40 minutes of standby time? I did read that. I did hear that right. If you turn it on, yeah, if you turn it on, especially the, the actual parachute is not insulated. So if you're in Canada in this current weather, you know, it's it, the manufacturer operating time is over an hour. But if you're in Canada with LiPo battery, not insulated in cold weather, well, you know what happens. It just Sorry, drops the I, I, I missed all of that. Then I cut off. Sorry, did you say so that was standby, you know, standby ready to fire time was 40 minutes. That's it. Yes. Yeah. My God, that's shocking. So you've, you so hold on a minute. So you can only fly for 40 <laughs> minutes. And you then can, you've not, got to charge it. Fly. It's not even flying for no, 40 flying, minutes, but right? I mean, activate the parachute. Yeah. 
Yeah. All of them for 40. What, what, what's and, and 40, doing? And 40, 40 minutes was when this was tested at the beginning of the winter when it was about plus 5 Celsius. So now with, uh, with minus 10, we don't know how long that LiPo battery is going to last. We can probably have that. It's reasonable. Yeah. So wait a minute. What's it doing to draw that much power? I would think it would... <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> yeah, it's it's in, in the valves, the valves draw a lot of current. Wow. Yeah, well, yeah the valves are heating it up so it can operate in minus ten. But they, let's they just really... remind everybody, as Victor said earlier, that on the that former FAA director Herter is on their advisory board. If you want to answer any questions, just remember that former FAA director Herter is on their advisory board. That's good enough. So hold on a minute. We have a device which you have to strap to your drone yourself, charge before you bring it to the, the takeoff location. From the moment you turn it on, you have between 40 minutes and one hour of flight time, and then the device is useless. And then so any operations must have happened within that 40 minutes. Any pre-flight checks with all equipment heated up, on, ready to go, must all happen within that 40 minutes to one hour. And then once you're done, you then have to go take it away and charge it again for how, how long do you say it takes to charge? Over an hour. Over an hour. And then what? <laughs> Just no. He, Ian is very picky, isn't he? He's always looking to find fault. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's not for, for purpose, not reasonable, not realistic. Hey, then you've just described the NPRM in the USA at the moment. They ain't sending what? me one to test, are they? That's for sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I've flown, as I said last week, I've flown, uh, I've flown a fixed wing aircraft with parachutes, and people wanted to op operate them uh, very low level. If there's any wind, I mean, all the all the train, and then at Palm Row, we saw the Israeli ones being dragged off down the runway in the wind, dragging the aircraft off. There's so many variables that occur when you fire the parachute that you're suddenly not in any control of, if it really is an incident or accident coming your way and you have the opportunity, you were probably better off ditching the aircraft somewhere where you are in control of that crash. It's, it's a crash is a crash is a crash. Um, Most parachutes are for when you don't have enough fuel to get to the scene of the crash. To the incident, yes, yes. Now, the one thing is uh, we noticed when you deployed the parachute, it, uh, it shoots off the shell, right? So that whole parachute unit has a little cover. So several uh, of the videos we saw from uh, from YouTube is people were testing this in you know grass field. I, I wondered how they can find that little cover after because the parachute is repackable. So if you pack it back, I always wondered where, where does the cover go? And if you don't have the cover anymore, how do you actually use it again? We still don't know. Yeah. Well, and, and, and the cover's only $1,000. It's not much. Yeah. It, it's and imagine if it went equipment. off while you were bent over the drone. Imagine the impact of that in your face. I mean, this is a dangerous thing. It yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't stop. It doesn't actually stop the fall of the drone. It slightly slows down. And if you watch all the other <laughs> YouTube videos, the, the drones end up crashing. I mean, a lot of them, they go into grass field, which didn't cause much damage. But if you actually have concrete, if you have hard surface, it doesn't protect your drone, you know, it continues to fall. They just crash more slowly. You can yeah, save at the crash. moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they still crash. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's amazing. No, I, I encourage you all. Let's see if I can I can put your link in here again. Those dear viewers, just get into the comments now. Um, go off to the uh, LTX, LTX Academy. Uh, what does the LTX Academy, Academy do? Can, can we have some background on, on yeah, the Academy? Um, yeah, so, 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 so basically we started off as, uh, as operators. As I explained, we came from uh, film production and we used to build heavy lift. So one of our local community colleges came to us and said, uh, you know, you guys had great experience. Let's build some training courses together. So we became the first one in Ontario to uh, run Transport Canada compliant training courses. And a couple of years into it, we decided training was great. And part of the training was R&D, right? We get to do independent testing and try different things. Uh, so that's what we do now. So we're, we're a Transport Canada compliant training facility, but we focus on professional applications. So we'll focus on training people to actually deliver results. 
Very good. That's <laughs> a top answer. Yeah, you don't. You shouldn't be on this channel. <laughs> We're not this I good. mean, I, I <laughs> think what brought I think what brought us here was the fun things we do on our field. Um, so Gary, you found us through our second YouTube channel, YouTube video. But with the reason we released uh, a new YouTube channel this year was, you know, when you do training, especially when you train a lot of government officials and police, you have to say things diplomatic and professional to a degree. Um, but we enjoyed we enjoyed the fun part of the industry. Industry. Like I said, running different testings. So part of running a YouTube channel was uh, just, we're calling it Altex Labs um, instead of Altex Academy for the YouTube channel once we have enough testing videos. But the whole goal is um, this is all the back end that we do, right? This is how we can train people because we do all this testing and we have fun with the equipment and gives us a place to say things that, uh, you know, that we like to say rather than just looking at, oh, this is a training course. We have to say things, you know, professional to and diplomatic to a degree. Being diplomatic, but well, I could work there, right? Eh? What do you reckon? Oh yeah, yeah. You, 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 you definitely have a, you definitely have a, a place and space in that diplomacy section. <laughs> now, what's, what's your what's your thoughts on the industry in Canada? Then, where where's Canada at now? Um, the market, um, because we focus on commercial application, right? You know, the, the fun part, people just go and uh, and buy a drone. We see that market kind of stabilized quite a bit, you know, the, the market saturation. Uh, but actually on the professional implementation part, it's it's just the beginning. There are so many companies and departments are just realizing that they can use drones and uh, actually deliver results because too many people just jumped into the industry, bought a drone and, uh, and believe if they bought a drone and they have a pilot certificate, they can deliver results, but it doesn't, it doesn't work that way, right? If you're doing it for precision survey, um, if you're using it for filming, then it's very specific skills you actually have to go acquire. So I can't tell you how many <laughs> how many government agencies came through um, and wanting to do precision survey and realized when they bought the drone, um, it's a fraction of what the cost would be because they ended up spending twenty thirty thousand dollars buying computer equipment, being able to process the data after. <laughs> So those are all the messages that's slowly coming across now um, because at the beginning they figured it was just the cost of the equipment. And now they're realizing, oh, there's other things we have to do. Yeah, I think a lot of people have learned that training can be quite lucrative, especially if you're training government people because the government has unlimited money. And if they need more, they'll just take it out of your pocket. Depending on the department, surprisingly, um, I mean, with police and uh, and fire, they do have quite a bit of budget. Um, but the challenge is they don't really spend much on training. That's the part they don't recognize. They they don't mind going off to buy toys to buy expensive equipment, um, but they're not recognizing that there's a gap between buying that equipment and delivering results. And in between is where training and integration. So there's training and there's also with seen bigger demand on basically uh, people want consulting companies to help them to manage workflow, right? Again, workflow, especially for a large department, fleet management, personnel management, those are all the things that need to come in and they hasn't, you know, it, it's only a very, very small percentage that's started. Um, still, majority of our training are going to individuals. Like I said, you know, large companies are great, uh, but it's that market is just starting at least here in Canada. The implementation part. Have I returned? You have returned. So, do you live near Alan Yu? Do you know where Alan Yu lives? Who's he? Vancouver. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, he's been our duty Canadian. Yeah. He has. There's, the there's somewhere near Canada, Canada, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that he's the other person in Canada. I think there's, there's, there's at least three people there. I understand. Yeah, uh, have you seen Alan News uh, YouTube channel? Uh, no, I have not. Yeah, maybe he's, he's maybe my of... tech teams have. They they watch other YouTube channels. Um, I I deal with the fun government and uh, <laughs> and and <laughs> accounting money part. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Dealing with governments, give me your money. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, yeah. While well, the boys with their toys, right? I just get put uh, to the front. <laughs> yeah, uh, it looks uh, well. 
I, I have to commend you on on uh, on the quality of your videos and uh, and everything. Anna, it's it's a fantastic video that should be going nuts in our world <laughs> and our community. People should be. I appreciate that. that. Well, you know, I keep it on for more because we're releasing shorter videos. Uh, the challenge with those two first two videos, we released them kind of as special just to kick off um, the new YouTube channel. But we're releasing short three to five minute videos. So the next one we're doing, we're going to be setting some uh, lipo batteries on fire. Um, putting them uh, the temperatures, see how much voltage drops. Uh, there will be fun ones and shorter ones is what um, you know people not like not like everyone here, right? Because everyone here will actually want to see the in-depth details of something, but majority of the people they just want a quick short video straight to the point, you know, a couple of notes and uh, and that's about it. So those are going to be our regulars. They just want to see a nail going through a battery. How many have you got? About five hundred videos of nails going through batteries of new Bruce? <laughs> yeah, we're gonna do it a little different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been done many ways. I don't know. I haven't seen. Well, no, you you just destroy DJI equipment, don't you? And that's that's your channel's main job, isn't it? I just, just destroy everything at the moment. <laughs> just <sorry. laughs> Yeah, just give him something. He'll he'll rip the USB port right off. I'll, I'll break it. Yeah, no, no, no. yeah. I'll I, I'm in my breaking phase at the moment. It's uh, I'm, I'm I'm heading back into the repair and build as as the months go on. So um, yes, yeah, lots of fun stuff to come yet this year. Plenty of my time. Yet. A, um, a, a nursery teacher, and she'll she'll say every everything's a schema. When a child's being naughty, it's a confrontational schema or that schema. So you're in your Breaking things schema is how my mother would put it. Um, it's a rule of three. So I'm trying to think what the th if I broke three things, uh, I broke two. Um, it's, it's a problem when you build autonomous vehicles, they do try to drive off by themselves, especially when you don't want them to. That's the problem. <laughs> when you're still attached to everything else, that's the uh, that's they have the a issue. mind of their own. <laughs> this one literally did try to get away from me, so um, I fixed it anyway. I should have done a Louis Rossman video style repair on it um so that's not the dji vehicle that's your other rover is it that's, that's the rover that's the pixhawk rover yeah it was only the motor controller it, it wasn't important that i did fix it i did fix it um i just ripped the usb off the port as it was attached to the laptop whence it tried to drive off and the usb port was the weakest point but i've soldered wires back on so i got a connector there um to be fair i could have got away without doing it because I'd, I'd done all of the programming i needed to do the issue would have been as if i didn't needed to change anything again in the future and at 140 quid i didn't fancy paying that again to replace it but it is working um i've got to get that build finished i've actually I, I, i've ordered a new 3d printer so i'm waiting for that before i can um, print some more stuff so Good gentlemen and lady uh have we seen anything else this week that's caught our eye before we go We've just gone over the hour well, that nonsense has occurred. I can't think of. I can't really think oh, of any. I saw other. a report from an unconfirmed source. It's a uh, what is it? It's hang on a minute. I shall load it up on my on my interwebs here. Um, it's a. It's. I think it may be a recycled old one, but it's basically from a site called Inside Imaging where they say CASA indefinitely delays drone registration in Australia. And it says the Civil Aviation Safety Authority has indefinitely delayed amendments to drone regulation which includes mandatory drone registration for recreational commercial operators with recreational registration some years off. Now, the report's dated February 25th, but I think that's one of those sites that just mm, recycles. Sounds like the old story, yeah. doesn't it? Because um, they did definitely put it on hold, didn't they? Yeah, they cited the fact that there were too many people and it was going to take too much effort, so they're going to just put it off for a few more years to come. Uh, can't say too much, but we've got some freedom of information uh, stuff kicking about on two counts uh, in, in the Americas yep. and in the UK. Um, it, it's a bit quiet, really, at the moment, isn't it? it, it the, yeah. Obviously, with with the virus, it's meaning obviously China's from a new project point of view. It's hard to think that things haven't been delayed. No one's saying anything, but Autel have been very quiet. Um, Autel released their 8K Autel Evo 2. Right. Well, released as a is a is probably yeah, um, they they announced you announced it. released really. They yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right term. And they've lied twice on their marketing, but I won't go on that rant again. Um 
but yeah, th- they you haven't shipped. Do it quickly, because I doubt very much if uh, if I uh, watched your do do a quick summary. Yeah? Uh, uh, th- th- let's just say the, the the camera technology they're promoting isn't quite all as it seems. That's probably the right term to use. The eight eight K is. Uh, they're playing the same game as phone manufacturers have used. It's not strictly 8K as as other drones are 4K. They're using something called a quad bio filter. And actually, the 6K is out and out lying. It's not 6K. It doesn't actually meet the size of the HDTV council for 6K, which every single telly and product in the world follows, apart from Autel, who've decided not to and what they're going to do is say hey we've got 5.5k but we're going to call it 6k because it's over five um but it doesn't actually meet the resolution of 6k and it's there on their website if you look at the pixel resolution it's about 5.5k um but hey who can we were given a hotel Evo for a couple of months to test last year. So, so the first one, um, yeah. we, we didn't release the full video because we were testing this for a local retailer that uh, was approached by them. Um, yeah, there were, there were things we discovered um, that didn't get fixed with, uh, and we communicated this back to hotel, but we don't see those things getting fixed with uh, hotel Evo 2. Um, and again, you know, because we do so much film video work, <laughs> looking at post-production, uh, even if they had real 6K or 8K, you're going to spend a lot of money basically upgrading your computer, trying to even play yeah. that video or, you know, let alone actually edit it or render it. Um, I don't know where the need is for actual 8K video. I mean, back in film, when the reason we shoot 6K was because in post, you have the ability to stabilize the footage, to crop, to add yes. movement. Right, and to do that, you need to have really good camera with really good lens. It's not just about your 4K, 6K, or 8K. It's about the glass. Yeah. It's about the actual look. That's what's important. Um, and Auto Evo 2 doesn't do any of that. So if you don't do pro film work, there's no point shooting 8K. No, it's and it's not pro camera. You know, it's not a pro lens. It's you know, you know, the 8K is a, a half inch sensor, same size sensor as as a Mavic. You know, to re- the lens can't even resolve 8K at that size, let alone anything else. Then you've got the issue of how it will behave in low light. There's a very real possibility the 8K model will have a worse camera in most situations than the original Evo, depending yeah, on the light original levels. Evo, the camera actually yeah. wasn't bad. No. The footage actually they, wasn't bad. No, it's, but again, what I don't like is that they're, they're doing something no one else has done. And that's why I have a bit of a bee in my bonnet about this. Not Parrot, not Skydio. Everyone else has played the rule with regards to specifications of camera resolutions. So they follow the general HD council's um, recommendations of this resolution for this. And whilst there is like camera technology is always ambiguous. There are things like uh, line skipping, pixel binning, subsampling. There's always ways to downscale the image, but they are all putting in that resolution in the first place, whereas Autel are the first not to. But again, they've not delivered. Um, I've seen, interestingly, they have seen some footage of the dual um, model, the and it looks interesting. But again, yes, it's a higher resolution than the DJI and the Parrot thermal models. But... Uh, I think if anyone's really going to be wanting that resolution, they're going to be looking at something like the X-T2 on a, on a M200 or something like that. The, the problem is that they are a Chinese company at the end of the day. They're, they're not American. They're not anyone else. They but are they're still marketing themselves as, as US. They are. Oh, yes. It's, you'd be quite surprised at the number of Americans that uh, believe DJI is a completely American company. Uh, it's <laughs> the, I, I still see that uh, every every couple of weeks somebody says oh yeah but it's based in wherever it was based um yeah i still haven't seen what much of the sky do too i haven't heard from them no still pre-ordered no. still waiting for it still waiting for us and bruce what a shame the other on. ian wasn't on we could have had a real cameron nude fest today <laughs> yes <laughs> absolutely absolutely but they're not anamorphic or whatever it is that he loves are they he, uh, he's too busy pulling, pulling up floorboards and finding all sorts under his house yes that's right i thought is he is he is he pre <laughs> pre 
pre-preparing the area to put the bodies. But anyway, no. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, then you should you should have my CTO here instead of me. Then you can have a real geek conversation <laughs> instead of having the voice of reason here, which doesn't seem to fit, right? No, 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 no. We don't we don't have common sense. We don't allow we don't allow common sense here. No, the, the industry is is massively lacking common yeah. sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's why we're common here. sense so. is for those who have it. Yeah, yeah, it's. I, I think. I think. Release-wise, we're not going to see nothing for the next two months. I think the the virus now is going to be. I think it gives everyone a bit of breathing space in and out. Frankly, from where they were at, you know, all of everyone, you know, hotel set the the stage. For... No. Oh. Oh. Ian froze again. Oh. Well, it's, it's not going well tonight, is it? I wonder. Should we bog off quick while he's while he's yeah. not here? How cold is it in the UK? Must be it's... really cold. It's cold enough to make the Wi-Fi freeze. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah there you go. Um, it's it's been very very wet. We've had mass flooding. I actually managed to fly this weekend, which has been a rarity for a little bit of time. But some flight time through the Inspire Two and the Mavic Two. Um, you do forget. I haven't flown the Mavic Two for probably four months, maybe even five, because the last aircraft I was flying was Inspire, and you do forget how incredibly stable these little aircraft are you, you can just leave it sit in there and it's like it's just on a pole bolted to the ground it's incredible it really is or you could just bolt it to a pole it is literally a tripod you know and what actually is what's interesting if anyone flies inspire 2 how unstable the inspire 2 mm -hmm. is actually well the bigger in comparison uh, the, the bigger yeah. aircraft yeah medium lift heavy lift they're not as stable um, I remember uh, again flying heavy lift on the film set. The director said, "How hard? Can, how hard can they be just to hold your position?" Well, very hard. <laughs> yeah, it's you know you watch you you'd leave an Inspire two hover. It'll move around in a box a meter, a meter and a half on yeah. its own continuously. You know you can put a Mavic two and it will not move an inch. It just it, it's incredible. Does the Inspire have optical flow since? Um, yeah, 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 all the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 all, all the same. Um, it, it, they just there's, there's been a lot of talk with the Inspire too, actually, over the years. Whether the way DJI have the arms, they're not straight. They're not even when the arms are up. It's not a hundred percent vertical. There, there is a, um, well, a, a yeah, canter. A canter. Counted. There is a counter. I'm not to sure them. if if the weight um, and the way the algorithm works. I'm not sure if it's just not able to handle. Yeah. You know everything with the algorithm. She does pulse. You can hear the motors. You can hear. It's almost. It's not able to to stabilize. And it's constantly sort of. It, it, you know. Whereas the Mavic, you hear it tune into its altitude and just the the tone of everything settles and it's perfect whereas the inspire is almost like a lawnmower is the easiest term you can hear it hunting uh, all of the time um it'd be interesting to see if there is there's, there's a lot of people saying they they want another inspire this year pro users are shouting out for something more i'm not sure what more they really need inspire, from that. i mean back in inspire one time there was an inspire one ver uh, version two but with inspire yes. two there was never an update there's still never been an update, and uh, the the problem is the camera system is the best there is out there mm -hmm. in any drone of that type. There is still nothing that can get near it. So, other than a mild aircraft update, I really don't see what else they can do because no one else is still doing ProRes RAW or Cinema DNG RAW in an aircraft with an SSD. Then no one has even come close to providing that level of an aircraft in under five grand. So I. It makes you wonder why they would change it when no one's even trying. They could put a parachute in it. Yeah. 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 There was talk of that, wasn't there? There at was. One point? There was, yeah. Now Gary's gone. Oh. Look at that. Wake up, man. Wake up. <laughs> oh, screenshot. <laughs> <laughs> not off. Right there. Right there. We need a screenshot of that image. Oh, we do. This can be the thumbnail, is I it? Got yeah. it? I got it. Yeah. That's a great one. Host, host falls asleep in own show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's oh, oh he's gone but oh, yeah no, this guy's no, back, oh. in. No, back in God. i think it's a sign it's a sign we're over the hour my internet's on and off um yeah. it's it's like that in africa it gets like that um so ladies and gentlemen boys and girls thank you very very much everybody thank you that has been fantastic Eve, i hope we can have you on again and now you know the rules no common sense you know this you'll is know. fun yeah this is great i don't have to be diplomatic good to know <laughs> 
She's <laughs> making no, the rest of us look bad. Look at that bloody studio. I know. I know. All right. All right. Well, we won't. All right. I'll just make a note. Don't invite her back. Make her back. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Make a note. Invite my CTO back. Don't invite me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Get the other Ian on and the CTO and then go and make a cup of coffee. That's what we do. <laughs> hey, I like coming. cameras too. I can talk cameras all night. Yeah, I know you do. I know you do. Bruce, what's coming up in your video world? Um, I've got my, my own submission to the FAA and my guidelines video for how other people can submit to the FAA. Got a few reviews and bits and pieces as well. So pretty much, and some more footage from the big JIT meeting we had a couple of weeks ago. I like Beautiful. That. And Ian, what do we expect for you as next? I, I, I'm waiting on being able to quietly leak something when I'm told I'm allowed to do it. Um, old, people, right? some... old people, old <laughs> people. Keep those names old in there. I know, we're all there. We're all quietly leaking now. We're of that age, Ian. We're of that Tom age. On something. <laughs> quietly leak no, stuff. There's some good there? stuff. There's some good stuff around the corner for some of the products I've shown before. Um, Healing users, pay attention. Oh, put uh, it that oh, way. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, um, yeah. Um, I've got. What else have I got? I'm gonna do a video on fixing my power supply that blew up on Saturday and nearly set the <laughs> workshop on fire. Um, as I'm sitting there going. Something smells off, and I'm sort of looking around, not realizing it's basically on fire behind me. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on here? Um, so that's, an, that's another power supply that's let go. It's off my Inspire charger. Um, and I probably, now I'm feeling a bit better. I've got to get on with the Rover project. I have to. I've ordered a new 3D printer because oh, I couldn't I print big enough. Um, I needed a new one. My one wasn't big enough on the bed size for some of the stuff I want to do. So I've ordered a pair. Uh, I can't remember how you even pronounce his name. Um, you must know, Bruce. How do you say his name? Joshua Prusa? I don't know. Joshua. Prusa. Joshua. 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 Prusa <laughs> Mark III. Um, there's, there's a little group I'm in. We've all ended up ordering one. Um, so I'm gonna, I might even do a build video on a 3D printer. What have you got because now? The, the drone engine. I've got a Flash Forge Creator Pro at the moment, which has been the most amazing yet frustrating piece of equipment I've ever owned. In some ways, I love it more than anything else, and in other days, I want to dance around it whilst it burns, because there is nothing that can drive you as mad as a 3D printer, honestly. They're amazing sounds, technology. Sounds just like um, your average 3D printer to me. Yeah, yeah <laughs> they, they are. They, they're amazing, yet they, they can just make you want to chuck them out the window. But I'm becoming limited by the bed size on mine. And i got some bigger stuff I want to print. So, Good show. And if I when can we, um, can we look forward to videos on your channel? And if you'd be so kind as to post a link to your channel, which if I was prepared in any way, I would have had ready to go. But I don't. Um, it's our comments there, and that'll stay there. When can we expect some more videos from you? And if you haven't watched it, you go there straight away and, and watch the, the, the great parachute uh, video. So we are actually first. I'm actually not sure how do you post on live comments. It doesn't seem to allow oh, me to right. do that. Oh, doesn't uh, it? I, I put it. I put it in private. I chat. see that. There you go. Oh, yeah. I put it there as well. <laughs> so we're releasing the next one. Um, not next Friday, but the Friday after. And after that, we're picking up the pace. So it should be one video every two weeks. Uh, the next one is on drone setup time. So we have three drones and we had a, a set of um, criteria on uh, who gets to set up and how what, what are the steps that needs to be taken. So you have to calibrate compass, for example. Uh, propellers have to be off, so you have to put that on. So there's um, a set of criteria you have to meet, uh, but it's basically a sped up video showing how long it actually takes to set up three different common drones. So it should be fun. Okay. And the one after that is when we set batteries on fire. So I'm looking forward to that one. <laughs> We look forward, look forward to that. Thanks very much, dear viewer, wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much for joining us. 2100 GMT next week, and we'll be almost at NPR in comment point, will we? I can't think what the date will yeah, be. Yeah, there's, there's, there's one week left, isn't there? There's one week to, to get people to get their comments in. 24,500 people, it's not enough. It's not enough. It won't, it won't even move the needle. If you haven't put your comments in, put your comments in. Otherwise, you're going to get the rules that you deserve. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but oh, well, there is well, that life. <laughs> yeah, do you have a link to? Do you have a link to that? 
that NPR again. Open. Yeah, have we you posted the link? To, uh, put it in the description, Gary. If I'll put it in the description, yeah. <laughs> Preparedness. Oh, yes, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, dear viewers, wherever you're in the world, thank you very much. 2100 GMT next week. Look after yourselves. Be safe if you're flying. And, uh, yeah, see you next week. Cheers for now.